Hello uh, and welcome uh, to this theme is and uh, uh, Dow Jones webinar about trade-based money laundering in the Middle East. My name is James Whiteman. Uh, I'm a CFO and, and MD for MENA at Themis. I'm delighted to be moderating today's session, uh, which Themis has organized together with Dow Jones as part of our ongoing Middle East anti-financial crime webinar series. It's fantastic to see so many attendees dialing in from all corners of the world. Uh, a seminal recent report published by the Financial Action Task Force and Egmont Group of Financial Intelligence Units uh, emphasized that trade-based money laundering remains a profound and significant risk for organizations involved in trade and trade finance. This is heightened in the Gulf, where a multitude of free trade zones and reliance on exports such as oil, gold and diamonds expose related businesses to TBML threats. In today's webinar, we will be looking at the financial crime risks at play in the Middle Eastern trading ecosystem and analyzing what is being done to mitigate them. Our panel of expert speakers will be considering key challenges and best practice for industry, as well as recent government initiatives and regulatory expectations related to trade-based money laundering. I'm really privileged to be joined by Anne-Marie Lacour, Graham Bulldog, and Kevin New, and I'm really looking forward to hearing their insights. So uh, in no particular order, it's a pleasure to introduce you to Graham Bulldog firstly. Uh, Graham is currently the Chief Compliance Officer uh, or Money Laundering Reporting Officer at Anglo Gulf Trade Bank in Abu Dhabi, or AGTB for short. Prior to joining AGTB, uh, Graham was the Global Head of Financial Crime Compliance for HSBC in London and held a number of compliance positions over a 16-year career in the commercial world. Graham also uh, has a professional doctorate in criminal justice and has held a number of industry forum roles over, over the years. Also welcoming uh, Amory Lacour. Uh, Amory uh, is a global trade management domain expert uh, and innovative compliance practitioner. She has 25 plus years uh, of experience in international trade operations, compliance, product management, and sales strategy. She has deep experience uh, in developing and managing global trade automation platforms to support international supply chains and has extensive knowledge uh, of multi-jurisdictional import and export regulations, AML, ABC research, uh, adjudication and investigations. Last but by no means least, Kevin New, uh, the illicit finances and strategy lead at the UK's HM uh, Revenue and Customs. Kevin has been working on illicit finances since 2008, mixing policy, strategy and operational roles, including responsibility for approximately 90 financial investigators and financial intelligence officers, delivering multi-million pound confiscations and cash forfeitures. Kevin uh, was a law enforcement assessor for the UAE's mutual evaluation review uh, of the FATF, so really uh, applicable and poignant for this discussion, uh, and recently co-authored a report about the latest trends in trade-based money laundering. So, to kick off, I'll, I'll turn to you, uh, Kevin, first, if I may. Uh, Trade-based money laundering really continues to be uh, a menace to businesses and financial institutions globally. Uh, and criminals are equipped to adapt their methods in the face of, of changing circumstances. Uh, Kevin, based on your experience working on trade-based money laundering with the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, um, could you tell us just a, a little bit about the current scale and the nature of the threat in the Middle East uh, specifically? Uh, thank you, James, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so I'm actually in uh, Abu Dhabi at the moment. I'm working alongside the UAE authorities um, in developing their response to the FATF report. So um, quite timely, uh, the webinar is happening. I can talk from looking out the window and seeing all the hive of activity that's happening uh, just across the water. Uh, in Abu Dhabi and the, and the ADGM. Um, I think that the question of scale is, is a really good one. It was something that we wrestled with um, quite extensively in the report. Um, we took a relatively conservative view. Um, so we aggregated values linked to the case studies we could 
we could be confident and, and validate. And, and we kind of estimated TBML accounts for something like half a billion dollars worth of risk. Um, but when you add in the kind of undetected cases, when you add in the exploitation of the trade system, not just for money laundering, but also sanctions evasion, you know, we're, we're talking of billions of pounds worth of risk. And as you described, given the, the Middle East's um, importance as a trade hub, a logistics hub, uh, the growth of services and financial industries, all of those aggregate together and, and kind of really present quite a, a challenge in, in terms of, you know, the physical aspects of trade based money laundering. So exploitation of financial free zones, exploitation of, of trade free zones. Uh, exploitation of the kind of shipping lanes that we see and, and the facilitation that happens between complicit importers and exporters. So that's kind of one aspect of the risk. Uh, and then the whole kind of trade financing aspect. So the actual process that allows the money laundering to take place. You know, we, we see uh, places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi increasing their prominence and their presence on the financial stage uh, and looking to do business right across the world. And, and that brings with it also challenges. So I, I think there's a real need to kind of maybe in, in other jurisdictions where perhaps it's one or the other, it's either the financial facilitation risk or the trade risk. I think in the Middle East, there's that real need to marry an understanding of the trade system and how that can be exploited, while also understanding what those financing mechanisms look like and, and how illicit cash might be integrated into the system, whether that's physically in freight, whether that's exploitation of money service businesses, which we see in the FATF report, uh, or also, you know, the more kind of traditional exploitation of, of business bank accounts. So um, that's just some context from, from what we saw from the report, but also my experience in looking at TBML within the context of, of HMRC and our concerns as to how we are exposed as the customs administration of the UK. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. No, that's a that's a fantastic uh, scene setter and gives us great context. So many thanks. Um, I think at this point, actually, it'd be, be great to jump in straight to an audience poll um, uh, to, to move things forward. The question I would like to pose is, what, what do you see as the most concerning current trade financial crime risks in the Middle East? Uh, we've got a number of uh, different options there from lack of understanding trade processes uh, through to misrepresentation of quality type and goods, and, and even I don't know. Um, so, uh, a, a real variety of answers there. I think we'll just give everybody a little bit of time to vote. But I think whilst they're doing that, um, I think it'd be nice just to highlight how relevant uh, today's discussion is in light of uh, the COVID 2019 pandemic and its and its impact really on uh, both trade and trade finance. You know, remote working disruptions to supply chains uh, and unprecedented demand for for med medical products certainly. Um, all provide new opportunities for, for trade-based money launderers and, and fraud, I guess, more thematically worldwide. Um, and I'll certainly be interested to hear uh, the panel's views uh, uh, as to how this play will play out in the Middle East. Um, but in the meantime, um, let's uh, see if we can get any uh, views or if we can pull up pull up the panel. Uh, so, um, Amory. If I may uh, move to you, just you know, looking looking at the results uh, that we're, that we're coming up with here, uh, as a global trade expert who's you know worked in both trade operations uh, and indeed on the compliance side, um, what are your thoughts on on the poll? Um, the poll outcomes do they surprise you or or not so much? Well, I would say that I'm pleasantly surprised. I think, uh, you know, a few years ago, if this poll was asked, um, you know, the classic under over invoicing, you know, reuse of shipment documents tend to be the types of responses um, that most of those in the financial industry, insurance, etc., cetera, um, would respond with. Um, but you can see that it's a multifaceted problem. Um, and I don't think any of us think it's going away um, anytime soon. You know, we've had scammers, commodity diverters since time and trade began. Um, 
So I think, you know, what brought us together today really is all about managing this risk um, and manage we will, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so reassuringly, you know, there's information systems uh, partnered up with screening content that frankly is getting better at spotting anomalies, um, which in turn, you know, proactively alerts trade, can proactively alert trade compliance staff to the types of things that, again, I feel like a few years ago would have been uh, the top answers, you know, the under over uh, multi-shipment use, um, diversion risk, where, um, you know, these can be more programmed now um, to, to be caught. And that's fantastic because the other side, you know, lie, cheat and steal for a living. Um, so they're pretty good at what they do, right, Kevin? Um, yeah. Takes a lot of work. So these tools are good. Um, I think some recent countermeasures that I've seen um, or in, in some cases help implement for clients in both their physical as well as the financial supply chain really wouldn't have been uh, possible without advancements in AI and some of the other um, tech fields. Uh, examining import-export paperwork, um, we can do three, four, even five-way matching now between the broker entry, customs mm -hmm. entry, your warehouse receipts, whether it's a free trade zone or bonded warehouse or a physical commercial warehouse. Comparing that with the purchase order, commercial invoice, and then both the customs commercial invoice and the commercial, the transactional commercial invoice, making sure everything is lining up simultaneously, you know, validating the names and addresses on those documents, who they are, where are they really where they say they are. Um, those types of automation um, advancements bring us business rules that give the chance for those of us in trade operations to really take what's in our head and put it into a system to, again, do those proactive alerts. Um, things that would be very obvious to us as red flags if we were looking at them. But um, so, for example, let's say um, Incoterm, Incoterm mismatches like XWorks, DDP, they don't make any sense for the transaction or maybe because of the mode of transportation. Um, multimodals going on routes uh, that are high dollar shipments, but they're using ports that would make them uninsurable. Things that are just are never done in legitimate trade operations. But previously, a human had to be the one seeing that. Now tech can evaluate. So maybe in a few years, that list will be a little bit shorter. Um, but unfortunately, it will still be here. Um, you know, Kevin and the things that he's doing in the world um, will still be critically important. Yeah, hopefully that, that list will be shorter, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> And I think actually, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because there are clearly so many steps within the trade finance process. So uh, as you kind of outlined very clearly there, so thank you. Um, that obviously, you know, uh, I guess exacerbates really the risk or the risk exposure in that regard. Um, Graham, if I, if I could uh, turn to you, you're, you're currently based in Abu Dhabi. You're at a, a leading innovative trade finance bank. Um, could you tell us a bit more about some of the key factors that make trade in the Middle East vulnerable? to trade-based uh, money laundering. I mean, is uh, is it the, the type of goods that, that's traded, the high volume of barter transactions, or, um, or the strong reliance on free trade zones, or a combination of, 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 of all of these three? Um, be great to get your thoughts. Thanks, James, and thanks to Themis for inviting me yet again. And it's good to be with my panelists. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think the, the high level side of it is, it's a strategic, geography location and, it, and its network of connectivity with asia and everything like that the focus on the middle east and the for free trade zones and it, it this will come through again later on you know we need to understand the risks associated to the free trade zones they're not all the same but we also have to understand why they exist you know uh, from a compliance perspective and, and from a compliance industry perspective we need to understand a lot more around um, trading um, and 
Kevin and, and Anna Maria have mentioned, we talk about trade based money laundering, we talk about trade finance. And as this goes on, you know, I'm trying to draw the industry along the line of, you know, it's not just in trade finance. You know, there's a there's a lot of finance goes on that's outside of trade finance. And if we're not careful, we are, we're going to control the hell out of trade finance and you're going to actually stifle the product and therefore economics and the commercial side of it. But going back to the thing, specific things that have been pulled in like commodities, oil, I, I, I get that. But it's a corridor that a, a trade is a corridor and it will start somewhere before it comes to the Middle East. And so this sort of public sector, private sector partnership, which I'm sure we'll touch upon later as well, is key. Um, so I think the high level side of it is, yes, there is trade based money laundering. We know that there's a lot written about it, but it's around it about its geography uh, and where it sits in, in the sort of the trading cycles of everybody. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, it, uh, interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's also interesting to explore what's being done by governments across the region to address some of these trade based money laundering risks. Um, Kevin, you've you've done a lot of work with the authorities in the UAE. For, I mean, for example, in support of their efforts to crack down on financial crime, uh, including from a trade perspective. Uh, we'll be very interested to hear some of your thoughts around, you know, the, the local political regulatory law enforcement initiatives to tackle TBML. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, James. I think it's been significant. Um, even when I was here in 2019 doing the original assessment, the amount of change that has happened, the new, particularly in, in the UAE, I should add, the, mm -hmm. the amount of cabinet re resolutions that have been developed, the introduction of a national economic register that the demand that company registrars and others you know validate uh, ultimate beneficial ownership information um, or face quite severe administrative penalties for not doing so the development of, of more mature or the development and mature maturation of um, aml supervisors in sectors that can be at risk from tbml exploitation so company formation agents money service businesses um, these are all areas that have seen significant investment, both in terms of financial, but also resource uh, and legislative. So, you know, being here today and seeing that the, the depth and, and pace of change in the UAE in particular has been extremely promising. Uh, you know, the colleagues that we work with now are producing threat assessments that look at either factors that influence trade based money laundering, like corporate structure exploitation, but also kind of cash integration. So how that's happening in the UAE whether that's physical transportation of cash in, in bulk via freight, whether that's through the financial system. Um, we have a, a, a really strong and compelling relationship with federal customs colleagues. So we are sharing intelligence and information on a routine basis. And we think that can only go further. Uh, and in the last week, you know, the UK and UAE signed a landmark partnership agreement looking at illicit financial flows, but also in the context of, of broader economic and security cooperation. So um, you know, we are working with our with our counterparties in, in the UAE on particular work streams, so supervision and a risk based approach. Um, I think it's important to while this particular webinar isn't about that, but it's also important to recognize the threat of trade based terrorism financing. Um, so there is a work stream dedicated to terrorism financing uh, and perhaps the third and most ambitious and, and arguably the most stretching is a work stream really focusing on those shared illicit financial flows. And so how the UK as a jurisdiction exports risk to other parties, including the UAE and our professional money laundering networks, our trade based money laundering individuals. So I'm really I'm really kind of excited for what that relationship will look like, in addition to kind of some of the really good stuff we have. And Graham's already alluded to it, but the recent commitment to develop a public private partnership. Again, I think it's been a, has been a landmark uh, development in terms of UAE relationships with the private sector and the financial institutions that are based in whether that's a financial free zone or on the mainland. We, we you know, in the UK have had one for the best part of six years. Uh, we know colleagues in the US and elsewhere have had some form of, of public private partnership for some time. But the value that they bring cannot be underestimated. And we know FATF are, are you know, significant proponents of that dynamic relationship between the public and private sector. And that can focus on strategic insight. So understanding what are our shared risks and, and does what the private sector see validate what the public sector see, because the worst thing you would want is a, is a dichotomy of concern, but also you can really get into operational intelligence sharing. Um, so, you know, specifically 
law enforcement has a transaction of concern they, or an individual of concern, they share that with the bank or, or the other financial institution. And then, we can, you know, that kind of relationship cycle really kicks into gear. Now, we might agree not to de-risk that client because we want to manage uh, their, their flow and, and use that intelligence to kind of augment our own investigation techniques. Or if we're looking for a quick and easy disruption, we might agree that there's some form of de-risking and they are taken out of the financial system. And because of where the PPPs are heading, we are now seeing better intelligence sharing across the institutions. So we're not seeing people get kind of financial institution shopping. So if HSBC de-risk them, they're not going to go to Standard Chartered and try and get an account there. That these firms are sharing their risk profiles and their concerns around individuals in a much more intuitive and dynamic way. So all of that in the context of the UAE and the, and the progress they are making in meeting those FATF recommendations, I think is is really powerful. Um, and, and we look forward to working with our colleagues on on more um, more of this more of these issues and interrelated issues going forward. Fantastic. That's, that's fascinating, Kevin. It's got really, really um, interesting to, to hear. And um, I guess from you know a third party layman's perspective as well, you know, seeing the announcement, as you say, between the UK, UAE uh, government, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of initiatives going on uh, and that's fantastic to see. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think as, as many of our audience will have experienced firsthand, you know, trade-based money laundering techniques are evolving rapidly in response to external circumstances, such as the growth in, in less tangible exports, like software, for example. Um, Amri, could you maybe tell us a bit more about the role that intangible goods uh, currently plays in trade-based money laundering? Perhaps you draw on some examples from the region. Um, yes, they, it, it's it's quite formidable. Um, so FATF made the decision to limit discussion of billable intangibles in their latest report. So you're not going to find much information in there. I understand their reasoning, but in my opinion, based on really two decades of experience on the ground, managing some of the highest volume trade lanes on the globe, I can tell you for sure, it's an area being so fully exploited that it does mm. need addressing. Um, and the reasons really in the numbers, you know, just for the US, a third of all exports, $711 billion, uh, were intangibles last year. Um, and that's pre-pandemic pre numbers. Um, so intangibles for, um, I guess, the audience are essentially tradable services. So software, R&D, uh, uh, like cloud-based computer services, so Amazon Web Services, tech support, you get the point. Things that are not being physically shipped they rarely fall under import customs oversight and even more rarely are subject to tariffs. So intangibles, whether a standalone cross-border transaction or sometimes interestingly, um, as a line item on a legitimate commercial invoice, um, it's just wildly convenient for those looking to exploit the global financials. I mean, they don't even have to bother shipping anything. So, you know, the overhead, the hassle of actually <laughs> exporting um, and importing. Um, and I said shipping. So the import and the export process um, are still there. So an intangible is still an export um, in nearly all jurisdictions. Um, declaring an export can fully legitimize or appear to fully legitimize an otherwise fairly obvious TBML transaction to an average FI or to your average auditor. Um, I've seen a mountain of instances where an import was filed, even though it's not required, simply because to the TBMLer, they want to look fully, you know, above board. Um, they want their transaction to look fully above board to an FI. Um, so intangibles accompanying intangibles um, more or less behave the same way. So in a situation where there's a tangible item shipping through the import process, 
uh, along with an intangible, those are actually some of the trickiest cases to resolve. So you have a commercial invoice and a customs invoice that show a thousand, let's say a thousand US dollar physical computer. And it's also shipping with a thousand dollars of worth, a thousand dollars or so worth of tech support, software encryption, intangibles. Well, how do I know there's a thousand US dollars of software inside that computer? I don't. And that's exactly why intangibles are such an attractive vehicle in TBML. Thanks, Anne Marie. I think that's uh, well very pertinent for, for for this day and age, you know. Um, and um, it's something you were alluding to as well earlier, uh, you know, on the digitalization or digitalization, yes. I should mm -hmm. say, and, and technology side and how that's evolving. Um, and you know, it's really transforming the fight against trade-based money laundering globally. Um, Graham, what would be fascinated to hear and, and get your views, particularly as, you know, as uh, Chief Compliance Officer of, at a highly innovative digital corporate trade finance bank within the UAE. Uh, what, what opportunities does the digital transformation uh, of trade finance present when it comes to tackling trade-based money laundering in the Middle East specifically? No, thanks, James. Um, you've only given me three minutes to talk about this, and, and uh, I'm, quite, I'm quite passionate, and, and I believe it's going to really add value. But, but no, take as long as you want. <laughs> it's not going to just add value to, you know, the mitigation of financial crime. The digitalization of the industry is going to benefit customer experience, speed of settlement, and and you know, cross border transactions, which then brings its own risk. But from a trade finance perspective, if we talk about documentary trade, you know, it's it's so suitable for the digitalization because of the amount of data available. You know, if we are genuinely going to fight trade based money laundering, we need to bring all the data together. You know, the, the different documents hold different intelligence. Um, a solution that brings all that data, whether it be through OCR, scraped, whatever it would do, hmm. bring it in. Um, you then need the technology and working with what I call the, the compliance and, and the risk owners to build events around that to monitor it. You know, I, I'm, I'm not shy and I've said it before, you know, to me, you will not find money laundering in one transaction. You know, the transaction monitoring systems we have today, we know are costly. We know produce a lot of noise and are ineffective. So by using the products we've got today with so we talk about trade finance bringing all that information together cross matching that holistically with the payment system because you know trade based money laundering itself is complex mm -hmm. and it's not unique to trade finance so we need to holistically assess the customer's activity <clears throat> and i found out today time is impeccable that the Joint Money Laundering Steering Group in the UK have just added to their guidance the assessment of connected parties. And in my previous role, we did exactly that under customer surveillance, which is in the public domain. So the industry is shifting away from this binary assessment of a transaction and holistically looking at it. The one thing I will just add, um, and having done some training on this in a number of places around the world, um, I spoke to a, a document checker, 46 years she'd been do uh, checking documents, you know, in the same manual way she'd been doing. And she said one of the biggest failings of digitalization was removing her control of touching that physical document and knowing it was fraudulent. So we've got to look at the controls that are in place today that we're doing manually, and we've got to try and replicate those from a digital perspective. Um, I don't know how she did document checking for 46 years, but good luck to her. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's good, it's needed. We need to move forward. Digitalization, AI, everything that, that Anne-Marie's mentioned, you know, can do all the matching for us, but we need to join forces across, to me, the industry, but the bank itself. It, we can't work in silos. Uh, products need to be assessed against each other. And I will just leave one, because I do like to leave something behind, you know, in the trade finance sphere and, and in operations, you will have the ability to reject a trade transaction because, say, for argument's sake, the certificate of origin 
as goods coming from a sanctioned country. Those goods are still on the ocean or in the air. The importer and exporter need to settle that contract and the exporter needs to be paid. What controls do we have in the banks that stop the wire payment occurring? You know, you, you reject it in trade, they still need to make that payment. So mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to map the products together to be able to stop that payment that we know would be illicit if we actually saw it in the wire system and could match it to the documents, and we don't. And I'm not saying there aren't controls out there, please. The industry is working towards everything. But the, to me, the digitalization of this means that we can sit around the table, work out the controls that we're going to get rid of, understanding that, you know, the products we've got today and then mitigate it together. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Graham. I, yeah, that, that joined up approach, as you as you mentioned, is so important. I think it's, and, it's, and it's obviously it's great to see that happening more and more within the Middle East from you know, from the public sector through to the private sector. But then in addition to that, as you say, it's it's you know leveraging technology, getting the right controls in place uh, to be able to identify and I guess mitigate risks in in, in that respect for, for TBML. Um, Kevin, moving moving on, if, if I may, um, just looking back to December last year, the Financial Action Task Force uh, and the Egmont Group published a seminal report about recent trends in trade-based money laundering, which you uh, were a co-author of. Um, based on the findings of, of this report, what, what sort of best practices related to the detection of trade-based money laundering would you be able to share with Middle Eastern um, private sector audience that have gathered around our virtual table here today? Thanks, James. It's, it's hard to think about the time before um, December 2020 feels like a, a lifetime ago. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, I was in Paris in, in uh, February, you know, just as uh, as everything was kind of shutting down. And it was a quite a, quite a, a weird, I couldn't imagine having that level of freedom that we uh, that we had at the time and just being able to mingle with people. It was, uh, as I said, it, was, it feels like a lifetime ago. But anyway, to your point, um, I think within the report, we, we looked at, much like Graham described, that kind of what is the system of detection that underpins the totality of trade-based money laundering. So what's the role of a customs administration and what should they be doing more effectively? What's the role of kind of law enforcement if that isn't within that customs administration? And what should they be doing? And I was quite struck by, uh, you know, the percentage within the poll looking at that level of understanding of trade financing and, and trade-based money laundering activity. And, you know, speaking quite candidly, that's something that law enforcement really needs to work on. We need to partner with Graham and Anne-Marie and others and and kind of be prepared to say, this is as much as we know. This is as much as our detection takes us. Where can you augment that? And PPPs will deliver that. But also, I think there needs to be a kind of bilateral relationship with, with trade experts so we can kind of marry up our respective competences and capabilities much more effectively. Um, we also looked at the kind of risks inherent within the within the trade financing system and an open trading, you know, open account trading in particular. But we were quite keen to stress that as much as law enforcement like to add new regulations and requirements, but actually that's not an effective way of mitigating the risk. As Graham said, mm -hmm. if anything, this adds more cost and is likely to compromise prosperity uh, and, and economic kind of growth. So, you know, for us, understanding where there are additional opportunities to leverage change, which probably be a more effective use of everyone's time and expertise. Um, but kind of towards the end of the report, we really did focus on um, kind of new ways of working. Uh, and so public private partnerships were the big the big selling points within the report, but also the use of AI, the use of, um, you know, kind of fuzzy logic, the ability to interrogate uh, that, that trade information that Graham and Amory have described much more intuitively. Um, I, I do take the point that if you if you take away that kind of physical aspect of, of analysis, then you are kind of losing perhaps a significant percentage of our detection capability. So what can we do to to, to try and uh, replicate that through technology? Um, but I was quite struck actually doing a, a previous uh, Themis webinar on TBML not long after the report came out. And mm -hmm. I think from an AI company was involved and he was very candid about its limitations. Like there's, there's absolutely no way it can necessarily um, take a human out of the decision making process that at the end of the day, we're really looking about efficiency and decision making and making someone's life easier. So if they have multiple screens open, 
with different types of, of trade information, you know, we can use AI to effectively pull across that to, to be intuitive enough to recognize where there might be slight discrepancies, but still indicative of risk and then present that in a usable and useful format for that human decision maker. So, um, you know, I think those are areas that we as customs and, and, and trade facilitators are looking to implement. Um, you know, it, it just makes everyone's life so much easier uh, and, and the benefit of that kind of interrelationship that, uh, that AI provides across data sets is being able to take something from a tax database, take something from a customs database, from access to companies house that we have in the UK. So we can start to pull those threads together in a much more um, systematic way and kind of going beyond sort of rudimentary detections, you know, investigators feeling something's a bit sketchy to actually being able to validate that and then take forward an appropriate intervention. So, you know, I think the report really looks across the piece at, at knowledge building, at using technology and also really leveraging those public private partnerships that have become such a staple of our collective fight against all forms of financial crime, including terrorism financing. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I think that you make many very interesting points there. And it's uh, technology, AI is, is or it's a tool, I guess, is really what you're saying there, rather than the solution, which I think brings us, you know, maybe neatly on that. I mean, I, I guess many of our audience members will know all too well that, you know, even with the best knowledge systems tools and trade based money laundering can be very very difficult to identify um amory you've spoken to me before about how certain aspects of customary trade op op operations and supply chain practices make tbml transactions harder to spot um could you possibly elaborate on this theme uh, and its relevance to the middle east with our audience today perhaps with a, a case study or two Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I agree with everything Kevin just said. <laughs> um, you know, without, you know, losing the ability to see and feel that, you know, this set of trade documentation was clearly all printed on the same, uh, from the same printer, um, which of course would never really be the case in a real, um, in a real live legitimate trade. Um, coupled with, how did you phrase it, pulling, you know, all the threads together. Um, with trade, there's a lot of threads. It's messy. It's complex. It has a lot of moving and disparate parts. And then add into that, um, you know, what the poll showed, you know, for the most part, the amazing teams inside the FIs um, and equivalents, they don't usually know enough about how international importing and exporting mechanically works to be all that successful at keeping these compliance risks at bay. So I, I would say for the first part of your question, the complex, the, the, the natural complexity of trade um, and then the knowledge gap of those trying to manage it inherently make TBML harder to spot. So really, in my mind, the highest risk to approaching the management of all of this, you know, mess, if you will, is not how the bad guys are carrying out, you know, what it is that they're going to do. They're going to always be up to something. Um, the real risk is that we may not be focused enough on how to use the mechanics of trade operations to catch them. So TBMLers, they are using the mechanics of trade operations to carry out their actions. I have seen plenty of instances where it's clear to me that a TBML ops planner has actually spent time managing cross-border trade. They know things that they wouldn't otherwise know. And while candidly, that makes my day more fun and exciting um, for most others that don't have embedded trade operations experts advising them on their TBML compliance programs, it's understandably frustrating. And then, OK, you know, add in the Middle East. I mean, it is a really significant trading hub, both for the physical as well as the financial supply chain. 
Um, it's in a higher risk jurisdiction in close proximity to a risk relevant number of sanctioned individuals and countries. Um, it, you know, honestly, it's geographically desirable, let's say, to attract these undesirable activities. So it's really going to take some work, I think, to get on the other side of this. Um, and then the last part of your question, so really in terms of case studies or examples, um, frankly, there are so many um, that I could use. I used to conduct kind of the before times, as Kevin said, um, a three-day workshop just on really kind of looking at the way that trade regulations that are written really from the government's perspective on how to uh, you know, build enforcement cases, how to uh, manage the kinds of information that they're most interested in seeing. Um, you know, FTZs, bonded warehouses, so free trade zones, bonded warehouses um, are classic examples. So they're very popular in the Middle East, especially given the privileged status that foreign commodities can earn there but they have different trade rules to manage. And that's already over and above the complex activities that took place just to get into the zone. There are sub zones in trade, free trade zones that have another set of rules. So all of these layers give those intent um, on you know, carrying out TBML, just another area to hide. And then, James, I guess one of the um, other areas, just real quickly, reverse logistics, repair and return, repair replacement, RMA, it goes by a few names. But if I was going to launder money myself, that's actually where I'd head. Because under the trade rules, so and it's the trade rules from both uh, the World Customs Organization and World Trade Organization, so GAP, General Agreement on Tariff and Trade. Under their rules, I claim and I pay tariff only on the, you know, very small amount of value of the repair to the item itself. But for trade statistics and reporting purposes, and again, because governments want these trade statistics, you report the price paid or would have been payable as if this was a brand new item and a much larger amount of money. So if I'm in TBML, that's exactly the set of documentation I'm gonna to provide to the bank when I'm making my large deposit. Um, and really it's a very rare FI that even has the ability to know whether or not they're looking at reverse logistics or a first sale. So an RMA transaction, they may not know that it is. So um, the commercial invoice value of the transaction tops out at the value of the repair. So that's a candidate for all of this automation that we're talking about. Um, and it won't be able to be programmed into the systems designed to report anomalies so that trade compliance uh, folks can actually take a look at this. I agree, we're not ever going to really get away from actual people looking at some of these. But um, until we get systems taking this operational knowledge and using that for the triggers to bring it to our attention, we're going to have a tough time catching these folks. Thanks, Amory. That's, that's great context and insight. Um, much appreciated. Um, I think at this point, it's probably just worth saying to our audience that you know we would welcome any questions that you may have i know we've, we've certainly got some coming in but would welcome lots more so please uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you want or i'll try to get through those um graham i might just turn to you now if, if i if i may um i mean correct me if i'm wrong but i, I think a few years ago you completed your phd uh, which compared uh, cross-jurisdictional perceptions of corruption um and i wanted to touch upon your expertise in this in this sphere today and and really ask you what role you think corruption plays uh, in fueling trade-based money laundering in the Middle East. Yeah, thanks, James. It was a few years ago. Um, <laughs> and true to form, I didn't touch trade. Um, I, I was more around sort of Transparency International, Perception Index, that sort of thing. Um, 
But one of the recommendations from doing a number of, I, I did a, a survey, I also did a couple of focus groups in, in places like India, Hong Kong, and Mexico. And what came out of it, and one of the recommendations was further research, because that's the easy way to support your own research, um, was the fact of the, the automation of, of all the systems that are involved within the government processes of whether it's licenses, whether it's driving licenses, whether it's sort of building licenses, that sort of thing. Um, and doing a little bit of research for today, you know, the, the OECD, the World Bank talk about the hidden tariff, which is bribery. Corruption itself is an umbrella term for a number of the various activity. But if we look at the granular level of bribing government officials, customs officials, apologies, Kevin, I'm not passing dispersions against customs. Um, but from the research, you know, they talk about cross border or border tariffs. It's something like I think the World Bank's it was um, two billion loss. So if we look at the Middle East, and this is why I want to be slightly controversial yet again, if we look at the Middle East and we're looking at corruption at say the border, and then Van Marie and, and Kevin's mentioned the free trade zones and the risks they carry. My understanding reading a couple of documents is that the free trade zones lack certain regulation, certain tariff control and certain intervention by customs. So by its nature, then it could be low corruption risk because you haven't got the intervention of the public official at the gate or the border or anything like that. So from a corruption perspective, we need to look at this in a totally different way. Yes, we are sort sure that trade based money laundering is occurring. There are illicit goods moving around. Banks can only do so much. You know, Anne Marie mentioned the you know the product to reverse logistics. We won't know that necessarily. We might not have the documents for it. So from a corruption perspective, and I think that's something through an, a slight another organization I'm belonging to, uh, another forum, we're trying to look at bribery and corruption in the Middle East. It's a it's a sensitive topic. We can sit here quite freely and talk about trade based money laundering, we can talk about the movement of goods. But when you start to talk about corruption, that's a slightly different political topic to look at. Um, and lots of people don't like to talk about it. There's a lot not written about it, but it's a big area of, of, of discussion as well. So we've sort of got this. Is there corruption in trade in the Middle East? Well, a lot of that's around about the interaction with government officials. If free trade zones don't allow the interaction with government officials, then maybe there isn't as much corruption risk in some of these free trade zones as we, we think. Personally, that's only from an academic perspective. And, and I would sort of turn to someone like Kevin or something like that to talk more about it on the ground. Um, um, but that's how, you know, you asked me the question. <laughs> I did a bit of research and that's what I've come up with. Thanks, Graham. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Um, I think at this stage, we'll wrap up the panel discussions. We've got some really great questions coming in from our audience today um, and please feel free to keep sending them in um, that's not a problem at all right so our first question uh, perhaps this one's for Kevin from Rolf Spiegel if I pronounced uh, uh, Rolf's name correctly I hope so um, can you talk about the privacy concerns associated with sharing information across national borders and agencies yeah, thank you, Rolf. I think it's a really good question, particularly as I've been uh, lauding the growth of PPPs and, you know, potentially those becoming uh, transnational and working across borders. But, you know, so from a domestic perspective in the UK, we have quite, I would say, liberal leg legislation that allows law enforcement agencies and customs agencies to share information dynamically where we know or suspect a criminal offence has taken place. Uh, and I believe, you know, most of the financial institutions within our own PPP framework have a similar um, opportunity to expedite kind of breaching what might be considered privacy laws, because actually it's for the greater good. It's for the economic and social good. So we use those quite extensively and our, and our kind of partner agency, the National Crime Agency, has a very broad gateway under Section 7 of the Crime and Courts Act to essentially act as the facilitator between us, between private sector, right across the board. So that isn't just restricted to banks. That could be uh, freight forwarders. That could be others involved in the supply chain. 
that could also be those that aren't necessarily captured by money laundering regulations, which I think is a critical point. Um, in terms of how that works across other jurisdictions, you know, clearly the growth of PPPs would suggest that mm -hmm. countries are finding sensible and pragmatic workarounds and they are introducing either brand new legislation or revising ex existing legislation to tolerate that actually banks or institutions may be breaching privacy concerns because ultimately it's for sharing insight and intelligence around uh, compelling financial crime risks. And, and as I said, that could include terrorism financing where speed is of the essence. In terms of you know, that kind of cross-border cooperation, I think that is where we, we start to see some tension potentially as, as you know, one country's relatively liberal approach to data sharing might not necessarily marry up with another's, which is slightly more conservative. Uh, I think, you know, where practical, a lot of that cooperation happens between law enforcement agencies. Uh, usually there is some form of mechanism for sharing information. So from a, from a parochial perspective in HMRC, we have the, the joint uh, chiefs of global tax enforcement. So that includes the US, Canada, our colleagues in the Netherlands and Australia, all our various tax administrations working together to share. I think in the last two years, we've shared more information than we have in the previous 10 around cross-border issues like trade-based money laundering, like the growth in crypto asset exploitation. And what we're then doing is kind of using those respective agencies to filter that back into the private sector. So we're kind of building that virtuous intelligence and information cycle. But I really would like to see us kind of move beyond that and, and see the PPPs talking amongst themselves. Because, you know, TBML is, is multinational. It's absolutely not within HMRC's gift to tackle the risk, the UK's exposure to it. We need to work with colleagues in the Middle East, in the Asia Pacific region, you know, in, in the Americas. So the more we can share information and insight, the more effective we can be at tackling that risk. So we do take a very pragmatic approach, but where we have that compelling need, we can share information quite dynamically. Fantastic. That's a, that's a really, really interesting insight. Thank you, Kevin. Much appreciated. And, and you, you know, uh, it's, it's great to hear you alluding so much referring so much to sharing of information, which I think is uh, really what underpins uh, a, a lot of, you know, the initiatives that are, uh, are driving forward change, uh, certainly within the Middle East. Um, I might move on to our second audience question now uh, from Mohammed. We, uh, we've spoken a lot about TBML in the UAE specifically. I'd like, I'd be interested to hear more about how TB, the TBML risk landscape looks in the broader region, um, and that's for anyone. I don't know if, uh, if, if there are any hands going up to take that, but um, I, I'd like to put that, open that out to the floor, if I may. I'll uh, have an attempt of it because of my previous role as a global role. Um, the trends and typologies can vary between the corridors, and and this is where the original question you is lack of is lack of knowledge also fueling TBML with us. There is, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of vendor information out there. And you know, through Kevin's world, there's a lot of papers around the trends and typologies impacting um, the certain corridors from say South Africa to somewhere, from Mexico to somewhere, and the goods will vary. I'm not gonna mm. send certain goods. And through that assessment, and back to Amory's sort of the understanding by the trade operations these people that are dealing with the trades on a daily basis start to understand which goods belong to which corridor and when it starts to fall outside of that corridor then there's a red flag and, and i know themis and i'm not selling anything to themis as you know do the country reports and everything there is a lot of information out there to be assessed of, of these specific trends and typologies but it, you, you need to be proactive to find it the, the, the powers that be need to be able to disseminate this into our world. And then you need to either proactively go and look through your book, which is actually a look back and then becomes time consuming and is it cost effective, or tune your systems for the future state to identify different trends within trade-based money laundering. I hope that goes some way of answering it. It certainly does. Thank you, Graham. I don't know if anyone else has uh, uh, got any comments on that. Um then you're welcome to. Anne-Marie, Kevin, I don't know if you have any thoughts. 
Well, I was just going to add, there's not much to add there, but Graham is, is, is really exactly right. You know, it takes me five seconds, you know, looking through the list of HTS codes, waiting for entry or, uh, you know, popping up on these are the things that are coming in off of whether it's a letter of credit, documentary collection, to know that something's just, okay, we've got to pull this. This is very abnormal uh, for this to be running through here. And, you know, again, and I'm probably the least um, person on this panel to really be talking about automation and tech, but I just know that the big difference that it has made in my life, my team's life, in being able to free us up to manage the things that we only we can really manage, that's the exact kind of thing that does need to be programmed in. You know, we'll sit down, we'll tell the IT folk, okay, this, 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 this is normal. We'll do the look back um, and say, okay, anything that falls outside of these ranges of HTS numbers, and HTS numbers are harmonized tariff schedule numbers um, that work in ranges, they have a, a, a logical flow to them. So kind of a smart part logic that uh, some on the commercial side might recognize. And trigger us, tell us if anything falls outside of these ranges. So where the business rules and automation come together with um, the information necessary to perform, um, you know, the diligence on the commodity side. And also I think marrying that up with the information that um, is out there now about companies that are doing business. You know, I can get kind of a, a yellow status, a, hey, watch out, something is not quite right. State-owned entities moving goods of this HTS category across this trade lane, odd. Let me know. So the coupling of content sets with those country reports, which are really fantastic, um, marrying that together, layering on what the government knows, you know, cases that they're working on, um, you know, their advisories and alerts, and then, uh, you know, adding the kind of the trade layer nuances on of, of the trade regs, I think is really kind of like the trifecta of uh, wherewithal to manage the TBML. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Um, that's fascinating. And thank you very much for our audience um, for these excellent questions. Um, I'm afraid we're nearing the end of our webinar. Uh, so we will not unfortunately be able to tackle all of the, the other questions that, we, that have come through. However, our speakers have kindly offered to cover some of the remaining questions in writing after the session. So please stay tuned for that, um, as well as a summary briefing note about trade base money laundering um, in the Middle East. Uh, you can find out more about the financial crime landscape of many jurisdictions in the Middle East by consulting um, Themis' uh, brand new suite of country risk reports, as you very kindly uh, alluded to, um, which provide you really with all the tools you need to reduce your financial crime risk exposure when conducting business in the region. Um, for, for more information about the country risk reports, these are available uh, in the handouts tab on your screen uh, or on the Themis website. Uh, before we conclude this session, uh, I'd most importantly like to say a huge thank you to our wonderful panellists, Anne-Marie LaCour, uh, Graham Baldock and Kevin New for sharing their insights and real expertise uh, with us all today. It's been really interesting and a really informative session um, and also I'd like to thank very much also Dow Jones uh, for your support in, in organising and broadcasting this webinar. Uh, we're delighted to be working with you and and really look forward to the last session in this anti-financial crime webinar series, uh, which will be about ultimate beneficial ownership in, in the Middle East, which is actually you know, going to be a, a fascinating one. We've got some fantastic speakers for that lined up as well. Um, this will be held on the 19th of October, and we have another great uh, panel lined up, as I mentioned. Um, and finally, I think just to really um, thank everybody for tuning in to this webinar from the different parts of the world. Thank you so much for listening um, wishing you all a lovely afternoon or morning or evening uh, wherever you may be uh, thanks very much take care all the best bye bye